Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter thirty one one when he was away from her, while he kicked about the garage and swept the snow off the running board and examined a cracked hose connection, he repented. He was alarmed and astonished that he could have flared out at his wife, and thought fondly how much more lasting she was than the flighty bunch. He went in to mumble that he was sorry and didn't mean to be grouchy, and to inquire as to her interest in a movie but in the darkness of the movie theater he brooded that he'd gone and tied himself up to Myra all over again. He had some satisfaction in taking it out on Tannis Judique. Hang Tannis, anyway, why, she'd gone and got him into these mix-ups. Made him all jumpy and nervous and cranky. Too many complications. Cut him out. He wanted peace. For ten days he did not see Tannis nor telephone to her and instantly she put upon him the compulsion which he hated. When he had stayed away from her for five days, hourly taking pride in his resoluteness, and hourly picturing how greatly Tannis must miss him, Miss McGowan reported, "'Miss Judique on the phone. Like to speak to you about some repairs?' Tannis was quick and quiet. "'Mr. Babbitt? Oh, George?' This is Tannis. I haven't seen you for weeks, days, anyway. You aren't sick, are you? No, just been terribly rushed. I uh, think there'll be a big revival of building this year. Got to, uh, got to work hard. Of course, my man, I want you to. You know, I'm terribly ambitious for you, much more than I am for myself. I just don't want you to forget poor Tannis. Will you call me up soon? Sure, sure, you bet. Please do. I shan't call you again. He mediated. Poor kid. But gosh, she ought to phone me at the office. She's a wonder, sympathy, ambitious for me. But gosh, I won't be made and compelled to call her up till I get ready. Darn these women, the way they make demands. It'll be one long old time before I see her. But gosh, I'd like to see her tonight. Sweet little thing. Uh, cut that, son. Now you've broken away. Be wise. She did not telephone him again, nor he, but after five more days she wrote to him. Have I offended you? You must know, dear. I didn't mean to. I'm so lonely and I need somebody to cheer me up. Why didn't you come to the nice party we had at Carrie's last evening? I remember she invited you. Can't you come around here tomorrow, Thursday evening? I shall be alone and hope to see you. His reflections were numerous. Doggone it! Why can't she let me alone? Why can't women ever learn a fellow hates to be bulldozed, and they always take advantage of you by yelling how lonely they are? Now, it isn't nice of you, young fellow. She's a fine, square, straight girl, and she does get lonely. She writes a swell hand, nice-looking stationery, plain, refined. I guess I'll have to go see her. Well, thank God I got till tomorrow night free of her, anyway. She's nice, but hang it, I won't be made to do things. I'm not married to her, nor by golly going to be. Oh, rats, I suppose I better go see her. 2. Thursday, the tomorrow of Tannis's note, was full of emotional crises. At the Roughnecks' table at the club, Verge Gunch talked of the Good Citizens League, and it seemed to Babbitt deliberately left him out of the invitations to join old Matt Pinneman and the general utility man at Babbitt's office, had troubles, and came in to groan about them. The oldest boy was no good, his wife was sick, and he had quarreled with his brother-in-law. Conrad Lighty also had troubles, and since Lighty was one of his best clients, Babbitt had to listen to him. Mr. Lighty, it appeared, was suffering from a peculiarly interesting neuralgia, and the garage had overcharged him. When Babbitt came home, everybody had troubles. His wife was simultaneously thinking about discharging the impudent new maid and worried lest the maid leave, and Tinka desired to denounce her teacher. "'Oh, quit fussing,' Babbitt fussed. "'You never hear me whining about my troubles, and yet if you had to run a real estate office, why—' Today I found Miss Bannigan was two days behind with her accounts, 
and I pinched my finger in my desk, and Lighty was in and just as unreasonable as ever. He was so vexed that after dinner, when it was time for a tactful escape to Tanis, he merely grumped to his wife, Gotta go out. Be back by eleven, should think. Oh, you're going out again? Again? What do you mean again? Haven't hardly been out of the house for a week. Are you, uh, are you going to the Elks? Nope. Gotta see some people. Though this time he heard his own voice and knew that it was Kurt, though she was looking at him with wide-eyed reproach. He stumped into the hall, jerked on his ulster and fur-lined gloves, and went out to start the car. He was relieved to find Tannis cheerful, unreproachful, and brilliant in a frock of brown net over gold tissue. You poor man, having to come out on a night like this. It's terribly cold. Don't you think a small highball would be nice? Now, by God, Golly, there's a woman with Sammy. I think we could more or less stand a highball if it wasn't too tall of a one, not more than a foot tall. He kissed her with careless heartiness. He forgot the compulsion of her demands. He stretched in a large chair and felt that he had beautifully come home. He was suddenly loquacious. He told her what a noble and misunderstood man he was, and how superior to Pete Fulton Bemis and the other men of their acquaintance, and she, bending forward, chin and charming hand, brightly agreed. But when he forced himself to ask, Well, honey, how's things with you? She took his duty question seriously, and he discovered that she too had troubles. Oh, all right, but I did get so angry with Carrie. She told Minnie that I told her that Minnie was an awful tightwad, and Minnie told me Carrie had told her, and, of course, I told her I hadn't said anything of the kind, and then Carrie found Minnie had told me, and she was simply furious because Minnie had told me, and, of course, I was just boiling because Carrie had told her I'd told her, and then we all met up at Fulton's. His wife is away, thank heavens. Oh, there's the dandiest floor in his house to dance on, and we were all of us simply furious at each other, and, oh, I do hate that kind of a mix-up, don't you? I mean, it's so lacking in refinement, but— And Mother wants to come and stay with me for a whole month, and, of course, I do love her, I suppose I do, but honestly, she'll cramp my style something dreadful. She never can learn not to comment, and she always wants to know where I'm going when I go out evenings, and if I light her, she always spies around and ferrets around and finds out where I've been. And then she looks like patience on a monument, till I could just scream. And, oh, I must tell you, you know I never talk about myself. I just hate people who do, don't you? But I feel so stupid tonight, and I know I must be boring you with all this. What would you do about mother? He gave her facile, masculine advice. She was to put off her mother's stay. She was to tell Carrie to go to the deuce. For these valuable revelations she thanked him, and they ambled into the familiar gossip of the bunch, of what a sentimental fool was Carrie, of what a lazy brat was Pete, of how nice Fulton Bemis could be. Of course, lots of people think he's a regular old grouch when they meet him because he doesn't give em the glad hand, the first crack out of the box, but when they get to know him, he's a corker. But as they had gone conscientiously through each of these analyses before the conversation staggered, Babbitt tried to be intellectual and deal with general topics. He said some thoroughly sound things about disarmament and broad-mindedness and liberalism, but it seemed to him that general topics interested Tanis only when she could apply them to Pete, Carey, or themselves. He was distressingly conscious of their silence. He tried to stir her into chatting again, but silence rose like a gray presence and hovered between them. Uh, he labored. It strikes me, it strikes me that unemployment is lessening. Maybe Pete will get a decent job then. Silence. Desperately, he essayed. What's the trouble, old honey? You seem kind of quiet tonight. Am I? Oh, well, I'm not, but do you really care whether I am or not? Sure, sure, of course I do. Do you really? She swooped on him, sat on the arm of his chair. 
He halted the emotional drain of having to appear fond of her. He stroked her hand, smiling up at her dutifully, and sank back. George, I wonder if you really like me at all. Of course I do, silly. Do you really, Precious? Do you care a bit? Well, certainly. You don't suppose I'd be here if I didn't. Now, see here, young man, I won't have you speaking to me in that huffy way. I don't mean to sound huffy. I just... In injured and rather childish tones, Gosh almighty, it makes me tired the way everybody says I sound huffy when I just talk natural. Do they expect me to sing it or something? Who do you mean by everybody? How many other ladies have you been consoling? Look here, and I won't have this hinting. Humbly. I know, dear. I was only teasing. I know I didn't mean to talk huffy. It was just tired. Forgive bad Tannis, but say you love me. Say it. Love you. Of course I do. Yes, you do, cynically. Oh, darling, I don't mean to be rude, but I get so lonely. I feel so useless. Nobody needs me. Nothing I can do for anybody. And you know, dear, I'm so active. I could be if there was something to do. And I am young, aren't I? I'm not an old thing. I'm not old and stupid, am I? He had to assure her. She stroked his hair, and he had to look pleased under that touch, the more demanding in its beguiling softness. He was impatient. He wanted to flee out to a hard, sure, unemotional man-world. Through her delicate and caressing fingers she may have caught something of his shrugging distaste. She left him. He was, for the moment, buoyantly relieved. She dragged a footstool to his feet and sat looking beseechingly up at him. But, as in many men, the cringing of a dog, the flinching of a frightened child, roused not pity but a surprised and jerky cruelty. So her humility only annoyed him, and he saw her now as middle-aged, as beginning to be old. Even while he detested his own thoughts, they rode him. She was old winched old he noted how the soft flesh was creasing into webby folds beneath her chin below her eyes at the base of her wrists a patch of her throat had a minute roughness like the crumbs from a rubber eraser old she was younger in years than himself yet it was sickening to have her yearning up to him with rolling great eyes as if he shuddered his own aunt were making love to him. He fretted inwardly. I'm through with this asinine fooling around. I'm going to cut her out. She's a darn decent nice woman, and I don't want to hurt her, but it'll hurt her a lot less to cut her right out, like a good clean surgical operation. He was on his feet. He was speaking urgently. By every rule of self-esteem, he had to prove to her and to himself that was her fault. I suppose maybe I'm kind of out of sorts tonight, but honest, honey, when I stayed away for a while to catch up on work and everything and figure out where I was at, you ought to have been cannier and waited till I came back. Can't you see, dear, when you made me come, I being about an average bullheaded chump, my tendency was to resist. Listen, dear, I'm going now. Not for a while, precious, no? Yep, right now. And then sometime we'll see about the future. What do you mean, dear, about the future? Have I done something I oughtn't to? Do? Oh, I'm so dreadfully sorry. He resolutely put his hands behind him. Not a thing, God bless you, not a thing. You're as good as they make them, but it's just, good Lord, do you realize? I've got things to do in the world. I've got a business to attend to, and you might not believe it but I've got a wife and kids that I'm awfully fond of. Then only during the murder he was committing was he able to feel nobly virtuous. I want us to be friends, but gosh, I can't go on this way feeling I got to come up here every so often. Oh, darling, darling, and I've always told you so carefully that you were absolutely free. I just wanted you to come around when you were tired and wanted to talk to me, or when you could enjoy our parties. 
She was so reasonable. She was so gently right. It took him an hour to make his escape, with nothing settled and everything horribly settled. In a barren freedom of icy northern wind, he sighed, Thank God it's over. Poor Tannis, poor darling, decent Tannis. But it is over. Absolute. I'm free. End of chapter 31